everyone, this is uh, Shed Race from Sky 2024. I'm really privileged to be with uh, Late Breaker presenter, Dr. Howard Herman, who uh, presented the SMART trial. Dr. Herman, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Shed. It's a pleasure to be here yeah. in Long Beach. Yeah, th and uh, congratulations for, for the Late Breaker. Thank you. Uh, tell us about the background of the study. So the SMART trial um, is really the first contemporary trial that is comparing the two most commonly used TAVR valves in the US, the Evolu Pro, Pro Plus uh, platform from Medtronic and the Balloon Expandable Sapien platform from Edwards. Right. And we studied uh, and randomized 716 patients between the two platforms in patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and a small aortic annulus Annals, defined yeah. by CT scanning as less than or equal to 430 square millimeters. Right. And so we presented at the ACC, ACC recently yep, the yep. one-year results, which demonstrated uh, that for these two platforms, that the clinical primary endpoint, which was a composite of mortality, disabling stroke, and heart failure rehospitalization, was similar, non-inferior at one year. But there were major differences in hemodynamics. Um, we had a composite endpoint of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, and that endpoint was 30% lower uh, with the self-expanding Evolute platform compared to the balloon expandable platform for Superior. But we also looked at effective orifice area, the mean gradient, the DVI, um, all of which were markedly different. A 0.5 centimeter squared larger effective orifice at area one year. at one year, yeah. and a mean gradient that was 50% lower, eight versus 16 millimeters of mercury, and the DVI, the Doppler velocity index, which is less flow dependent measure of aortic stenosis, was 0.19 higher with the self-expanding valve. Okay. And this is for people who are small analysts, which we, by, back in the day it was, we usually refer them to root enlargement or something else. Right. Yeah. Right. So we know that TAVR is, has slightly better hemodynamics than surgery, yeah. and root enlargement is an ideal treatment, but it's open heart surgery, and many exactly. surgeons are not comfortable doing root enlargement yes. operations and don't do it that frequently. Right. The so other, uh, one other key point I yeah. want to make um, is that this trial was mostly women which is a very rare thing in clinical trials. Yes. Um, women in, with aortic stenosis are under-treated, under-diagnosed, and underrepresented in the clinical trials that 100%. we've done so far. Yeah. And in the small annulus population, 87% of our population was women, woman, yeah. which is a huge number. Absolutely. And about 80% of all women have a small annulus. So this is a problem that affects women more than it does men. Absolutely. And one that we need to pay attention to because women are so different both in their presentation, their pathophysiology, and their outcomes after both SAVR right. and TAVR. So uh, congrats for presenting these findings at ACC. So what is the uh, subgroup? So, Today, oh, yeah, the, the analysis. The so, analysis yeah. so today we're showing some additional outcomes from the SMART trial in a late breaker presentation here at Sky. Um, we're going to be looking um, at a few things, some of which were raised after the trial that we didn't have a chance to analyze, one of which is the, the size of the valves that were chosen. So the mean area for uh, annulus area was 382 square millimeters, but the perimeter was 70. And so there were a number of patients, about 27%, that got 29 self-expanding valves. And some have said, well, it's not really a small valve trial if you're using 29 valves. Yeah. And, and that's true, because we weren't doing a small valve trial. We were doing a small annulus, annulus trial. Uh, yes. Yeah. And the Evolute valve is indicated for patients with areas between 415 and 430. And I think that's kind of the point of the trial, is that in a small annulus patient, you can use a large self-expanding valve where you can only use a 23, yeah. which was about 90%, or a 20, about 10% of the patient's right. balloon expandable valve. Right. Yeah. Um, we also went back and looked at the um, choice of valve, which was done by the 83 site investigators internationally, and compared their choice based on the in, uh, instructions for use of each valve. And 90% in both arms were uh, got a valve that would have been recommended by the IFU. Okay. And about 7% were oversized and 2 to 4% were undersized. Perfect. So that's new data we're going to show today as well that shows that these investigators w chose the valve that they wanted to use in the patients, but most of the time, 90 plus percent of the time, it was within the IFU for those valves. That's great. So again, it's a, but that's a good, a good uh, question to answer is, uh, we always thought if we have a small analyst, means a smaller valve, means there's a PPM. 
that's a risk of you are taking with this patient, right. especially with women. But now this is more and better hemodynamic, different valve, and uh, the cervical expanding still kind of superior to the balloon expandable. Yes, we had uh, at one year the incidence of severe PPM, which has been the one most correlated with outcomes, was 10% in the balloon expandable arm and 3% uh, in the self expanding arm. Other data that we're going to show today that's brand new is we're looking at uh, an age distribution. So the mean age in the trial was about 80 years, so we looked at the patients younger than 80 and over 80. Mm. And they, those two cohorts differed by about 10 years and about 1% in STS predicted risk of mortality. And we examined the two co-primary endpoints, the clinical one, and as well as the bioprosthetic valve dysfunction endpoint. And they both went in the same direction. So there was slightly more mortality in the older population, but no difference between the two valve groups. And similarly, slightly lower mortality in the younger patients, yeah. but no difference between the two valve groups with negative interaction. That's important. And we did the same thing for the bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, and we'll show that as well. Similar superior outcome in the younger and the older patients. Now, in terms of vascular complication or anything, is there any difference? There were no safety differences with, um, with the exceptions. Pacemaker rates were numerically higher in the self-expanding group by about 4% at both 30 days and one year, um, but it didn't actually reach statistically significant differences. Um, there was a slight difference in the risk of endocarditis that also favored the self-expanding valve, slightly higher in the balloon expandable group, but again, did not reach statistical significance at one year. And the other endpoints, all of the other ones, vascular complications, um, similar things, were all similar at 30 days and one year between the two groups. Are you planning to have a longer follow-up on these patients? Yes, so the two co-primary endpoints and, and the data we showed then and today are at one year, mm -hmm. and all patients will be followed Followed for five years. Oh, okay, that's it. And the question that has arisen, and, and I think a very fair one, is how important are these hemodynamic differences? Um, we did see some slight differences in quality of life already at one year, um, but whether these hemodynamic changes that we saw that were more marked than we expected, and I think more marked than a lot of people expected, um, we think will affect eventually durability and long-term outcomes. Right. Um, but exactly when those curves will start to separate remains to be seen, to be and we're gonna follow these patients for five years to answer that question. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Herman. This is a phenomenal study, again. Thank you. Elaboration and complementary of what has been presented already in ACC. Uh, thank you for watching us. This is uh, Shadi Reis from Sky TV in Long Beach. Dr. Herman, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.